acres of information. And here we are. Okay. So uh, we're back and we'll practice our transition back into live in the future. But in the meantime, I'm here with Anurag Das. We're moving into round five of our legacy uh, open trial today. And we've got for you this round, we're going to watch a uh, pair of players who are three and one. Uh, we are going to see Mono Blue Prison versus Snow. Take a look at those deck lists. All right. This is an exciting deck list with the new Border Chalice of the Void. So this is a deck that is centered around many interactions. The first, the primary one is Lion's Eye Diamond and Echo of Eons. You sack your hand, you flashback Echo, you draw a bunch of cards. When you have a Narset in play, guess what? It's a one-sided effect. You get to draw seven cards, but your opponent only gets to draw one. We've also got a lot of artifact synergies here with Mox Opal, Seed of the Synod, and then Ancient Tomb to ramp out crazy powerful cards like Karn the Great Creator and Urza, Lord High Artificer. Yeah, this deck is dirty. It's got a lot of really strong stuff coming together and uh, is... It is not always pleasant to play against. It, it tends to function fairly well. It is not doesn't have ways to protect itself. With, like I mean, we have Chalice, but we don't have Force of Wills, even though we're a blue deck. So that's kind of one spot where you can sort of go against it. But it is it is a handful. And let's go ahead and take a look at Greg's opponent, uh, who's Ryan Haddad, who I believe we saw already. Yes, this, today's this, the Ryan yes. show for any fans yeah. of Ryan. This is the again the snow deck with a variety of removal. Abrupt Decay is going to come up big here in this matchup. Not so much Swords of Plowshares or really the rest of it. This, I would have to say, does not look like a great matchup for the Snow deck. I despise this matchup from the Snow side. I think it is almost unwinnable. Uh, you, your cards just don't line up well against the opponent's threats, right? You've got forces to handle the Planeswalkers, but they also have to handle the Urzas. They also have to handle the, the Echo of Eons and the Chalice of the Voids. And it's, it's just too much. You get overwhelmed and you fall back. All right, so this is tough. Onrog's calling it. Uh, get our backup matchup ready. In the meantime, let's roll it and see what happens. Yep. Okay, I actually the had the... Uh, yet, so uh, go ahead. What were you going to say? Yeah, just to, to further impound how the matchup goes. So I played in the Mox Qualifier uh, just like last week or the week before. And in the top eight... I played against Low Masters, who actually qualified playing the mono blue. I call it Echo Stompy just because it, mm. it sounds cooler. Uh, and I just got dismantled. It was crazy. So game one, I you know I had the mold of six looking for a force of will, and they went turn one chalice, turn two Karn. Right, that's just like the stock Stompy curve, and uh -huh. it just absolutely obliterated me. Going down a card for, to force of will didn't help at all either. And then game two was just crazy. Right, we had like a back and forth draw. Uh, eventually my opponent was able to, you know, flashback Echo of Eons and just take over the game. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the Echo with Narset is brutal when that comes together. All right, so let's see how this plays out. Looks like we've got the Blue Control deck, or the Blue, yeah, blue Prison deck on the draw. And Ryan leads off with a Ponder. Mm-hmm. So the good thing is, is that Ryan does know the matchup, so he knows he's going to have to stock up on the blue counters. But, I mean, this is this is what I'm talking about, right? Here's the curve. Turn one, Chalice of the Void. Does it resolve? If not, I got more where that came from, and it does. Yeah, this is tricky. I mean, this is not a deck that, well, it's not totally broken in half by Chalice of the Void, and it has ways to deal with it, but it's not pleasant either. Yep, leading on the, the basic island means that there's not going to be a turn to Abrupt Decay. Uh, I mean, Chalice of the Void is also just going to stop that from happening as well. Here, we might just see uh, some crazy curve involving, yep, Psy and then potentially even a, an, an Emery. Wow, yep. Yeah, uh, yeah, so the, the Thopter's going to turn on Metalcraft and allow the Emery. This is a nice turn. And then I guess next turn we, can, we can't quite hardcast Echo the Eons, but you know, we don't really care about that anyway. Who, who needs to hard cast it from your hand when you can just flash it back from the graveyard, right? Yeah. This is the power of Emery in this deck, too. You get to mill a couple cards. You get to buy back, you know, a draw spells like Mishra's Bobble. If, you're, if your Chalice of the Void gets countered, no problem. You can just use Emery to buy it back. And then even, you know, Lion's Eye Diamond is a good pickup here as well. So a lot of stuff going on here. This is this is an, a crazy threat density that we're seeing in play as early as turn yeah. two. This is, this is nasty. I mean, Oko comes down... Turns the chalice into an elk, which is just going to lead to a beatdown. And okay, sure, drawing another emery, that's not too great. But I mean, there is plenty going on here. I Yeah, we're going to reassemble chalice here from the graveyard. That works out just fine. And get another token. 
and Sayonara, Ryan. I'm sorry. You have lost to the pairing gods this round. Yep. <laughs> This is what I'm telling you. This this matchup yeah. is just too much. And like even after that, there was there was there was still like an echo of eons that could be flashed back. Yeah. So I I just don't know. And and that's the power of this deck, right? You just unload your hand on on turn one. You get some amount of value, and then the next turn you just buy your seven cards back and do it again, right? And it, very few decks can actually keep up with that kind of strategy. I mean. I feel like you just have like either have to have a, a slew of answers in the first few turns, or you just have to be on a strategy that, that doesn't really care about what they're doing. But that's so tricky too, right? Because I don't know what kind of deck doesn't care about Narset plus Echo of Eons just blowing apart your hand. Yeah, I mean, yeah, without the Narset, I mean, the Echo is not so dangerous, except that I mean, a lot of these cards, a lot of cards in this deck are free, so I guess they expend more of them right away, or cheaper with you know Affinity with Emery and. And it's just the cards are strong and they get out of hand. And I mean, that was just like, that was a really good hand, but it wasn't like, I mean, it wasn't anything like spectacularly out of, out of line. It just, it's just really yeah. strong. So see what Ryan's got to actually handle that out of the cyborg. Do we have anything here that actually makes a difference? I see one card in a row line. It rhymes with Smolector. Okay. This is a dumb joke. Collector oof out of the sideboard is going to be pretty good. Uh, I, I mean, this is the one of the weaknesses, right? So, like, if you can't fight this deck toe to toe, then you just have to cheese out a win. So, we're, Collector Oof is definitely going to be pretty good here. Just being able to say, nope, none of your artifacts work. Not your Seed of the Sina, not your Mox Opal. I also like bringing in copies of Back to Basics to double down on the strategy to just say, look, I don't want you to play Fair Magic. I, you know, if you're going to play this way, I'm going to play this way too. And then, you know, I see copies of like Pyroblast that we could bring in to to kill, you know, Emery, Psy, yeah, all of Echo it. and Urza. Yeah, I mean, all, all those cards sound good. Uh, Plague Engineer, the third Plague Engineer to try and deal with, like, side tokens, I think is probably not good enough, but maybe, well, we'll just, we would be difficult to know if we brought it in or not, but uh, I'm sure the, the two in the main probably stayed because those tokens, if the rest of your deck is working, you do have to deal with that also. Yeah, and this is a doozy of a hand here for, yeah. for uh, Greg. We've got couple Urza's Bobbles, but we've also got this Karn that could come down as soon as turn two if we find some acceleration uh, off these Urza's Bobbles. And then if the Karn doesn't succeed, no problem. We'll play Lion's Eye Diamond, sack our hand, and buy back the Echo of Eons. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we'll see. These Bobbles will just, you know, cantrip away. The delayed cantrips, which is fine, as we're still only on after turn one. I mean, what are we even... I mean, if, if our thing doesn't work, yeah, we'll just, like you're saying, we'll just restart and... Our thing may work. I guess it's yeah. not going to happen. Not that ha likely to happen right away. Oh, uh, but <laughs> and just like nope. that. Wait, not, no, not quite. Uh, yeah, no, we can't I don't do see it, it this turn. We can't do it this turn. Uh, I don't know what at point at which you decide. Well, you, yeah, there's no way you're breaking and firing off the echo when in dying to a force will or a red blast. There's just no way you're doing that. So mm -hmm. this is going to be a somewhat slower game. Yeah, in fact, a Plus, much slower game. You really don't want to sacrifice your your two of the strongest cards in your deck, right? The, the yeah. two copies of Karn and Great Creator. I think from this point, I expect to see potential, like, we're going to play a turn three Karn. All right, if it resolves, great. If not, don't worry, turn four Karn. And if that doesn't resolve, then we'll buy back, spin the roulette, see what we can get, and just keep the pressure going, right? Mm -hmm. Karn is such a hard card for the Snow deck to answer because it really does boil down to either A, having a board presence, or B, just having Force Will or maybe like a specific card like Pithy Needle that we know Ryan is not playing. Um, I, I, I think from this position... You know, this is why, I mean, and the Snow deck we know does, is not very good at cobbling together a board, uh, board presence. Ice Fang doesn't really do enough damage, and and Oko doesn't come down until turn three. Plus, Sorcerer Spyglass is pretty good against Oko, so there's a lot of, like, you know, back and forth interaction here. I'm kind of curious to see whether any of these cards resolve, and then if so, like, that's just like the first level of the sub game, right? Then we have yeah. to get to the next level and the next level. Yeah, this is, boy, Greg plays with the smallest actual play space window i think i've ever seen on on magic online i mean it makes yeah. no difference to the game but i mean <laughs> the, with the chat and all the things popped out this is tiny i feel like i'm looking through a keyhole at the board state it's but, it's it's minimalistic we'll call it that yeah. uh so here i <laughs> do like that uh we found the oko on turn three but i think this is um this is something that I've learned from experience is I probably would have elked the Arkham's Astrolabe. Again, I put a very high priority on board presence in the matchup, right? I was right? thinking about whether you elk the Sea of the Synod. 
Okay, that's actually interesting too. I didn't think about that either. Because that, I mean, that's basically assuming you can. I mean, you're probably going to have more removal than you than you have need of because there's just, I mean, there's not that much stuff to kill, and yeah, basically using a some loyalty and a spell to for land destruction might actually be worthwhile here. Yeah. And so I think this makes a little bit more sense now. We see that Ryan actually had a copy of Force of the Will, uh, Force of Will, pitching a ponder, and now this Oko is just off to the races. So mm-hmm. having a three three in play means that you can't really take down with Karn because they'll just attack it and kill it. Right. So now I'm kind of a little bit concerned. I think what's going to have to actually happen is we're going to have to probably pivot our strategy away from the Karn and towards you know maybe. Something like Urza to just impact the board or like size, something like that. But like again, Oko does make that a little bit tricky as well. So let's I mean, see. Let's see cool. how. I mean, we can only use the cards we've drawn, and we don't have that yet. We may be looking at we can put together some mana with with Karn and floating with Diamond and then Opal and see what we can wish for to to impact the board. Assuming it resolves. Okay, this is just a quaddle. But yeah, this this game looks much better for Ryan than well. The first game obviously was terrible. And okay, well, Karn's in. What is it gonna do? Right, <laughs> there's not much good stuff to do here because you know you take down Karn dies. All right, so would you trade your Karn for any of those cards? Probably not. And then, I, I guess from this situation, you may even just be forced to give up the Karn, maybe pick up a Sorcerer's Spyglass and just put it on Oko so that after the Echo of Eons, you have something going on. But got to act fast because there's a, a reasonable clock in play. Mm-hmm. And even yeah. there, too, you see the Red Blast in, in Ryan's hand, which is going to take care of the Echo of Eons. So we actually have to sequence the Chalice of the Void before we get to, uh, you know... Uh-huh. Yeah, well, that seems doable, but the, yeah, but then we're going to end up passing, even if all that works, our best case scenario is we're passing the turn with our opponents having seven cards and a full board. This is, this looks pretty terrible. You're, you're right about Spyglass, that is what is selected. Yeah, so we'll see, we'll see how it plays out. I mean, I, in fact, it almost feels like you're forced to get the Spyglass because any other target that you get could just get elked and... Theoretically, you could maybe make a giant walking ballista, but I don't. I don't see the mana available for it right now. So, okay. Well, <laughs> that's the grip. Yeah. So no. I mean, yeah. This is going to be the erupt K and the red blast. Both matter. The is that a backup Oko? Yeah. All right. Good luck. I guess so. We name Oko, so that gets handled. But mm-hmm. the spyglass is vulnerable. How do you? I mean. You could you could echo now to get the abrupt key out of hand, but you replace their whole hand. That's not that's not good either. Yeah, and I mean this is even like hoping that the uh, the red elemental blast doesn't connect either. I don't know if we we play the seed of the sign on for the turn. Okay, so we can't play city of traders either here. But right. delta coming into play, the creature is most likely just going to take care of the Karn, which will unlock the Arkham's astrolabe and therefore the abrupt decay that in in hand. Mm-hmm. Okay, that's interesting. Yeah, I mean, that's fine, but that's not... In the face of... Well, I guess Ryan doesn't know the Echo of the Eons is looming. Right. So, because, it, obviously, if he did, this this Uro is not worth a whole lot in the graveyard. Yep, exactly. Echo of Eons being able to reset Time Twister, both graveyards, makes Uro not exactly the optimal threat. Okay. okay. Yeah. That's a okay. big draw. You talked about you talked about Urza being a reasonable plan, and one has just been found, and that's really going to change things. Yeah, and In I'm fact, wondering here because now, well, I guess next turn we can still abrupt decay the uh, the spyglass, but spin the wheel. Okay, and and this is this is actually so powerful. I think we may have just been bailed out here because Urza. Yeah. Lion's Eye Diamond, Echo Vions, you get a whole new hand. You get to start converting the chalices and then the spyglass into mana. Even the Lion's Eye Diamond gets converted into it gets a little bit of a ramp here, right? Because you don't have to actually sack it to tap it uh, to get mana, so you can actually tap it to the Urza. Right. Yeah, this um This was the Urza, top deck. Still, yeah, it was. Like I'm not even hundred percent that the snow the blue control deck is now behind. <laughs> yeah, 
Oh man, and now we don't need to worry about the Red Blast anymore, so potentially Urza is just going to survive, and if the Decay is not there any longer either, then it seems like the, the Chalice of the Void could keep the Urza around. Oh, all kind of, we're going crazy here. This is quite a turn. Yeah. And look at that empty graveyard, right? So even Uro is just not, not doing too much here. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Narsa gets forced, but we're still not done. We can still cast, uh, looks like we can cast Emery. Mm -hmm. We can do... We'll see what the Emery mills here. But if we flip over an Echo Beyond, we could even just cast that too, right? Like, double down, keep the fun going. Um, I don't know. Do we, how... Do we have that much mana? Uh, maybe. You're right. Yeah, yeah. The, the yeah, bobbles right. would yeah. tap for mana, so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So a second chal a backup chalice on one, and then the bobbles, and we could also, I suppose we could cast another Urza, but I don't think we want to do that. Just get another token. This is yep. pretty, that was a pretty stunning turn. That was crazy, right? All off of one top deck, and so this is what I'm talking about, where the reason this matchup is so crazy, uh, favored for the for the mono the Echo Stompy deck, is that because every single card demands an answer, right? Mm -hmm. We needed the Red Blast there for the Urza, but the Chalice of the Void came in and stopped us. And how are we supposed to answer the the Chalice of the Void? You know, without proper mana, Karn locking down the Arkham's Astrolabe. It's just like one roadblock in front of another, in front of yeah. another. All right, so Abrotke is taking down Spyglass, which turns back on Oko, which can do. Uh, I mean, you. Jeez, oh, you have to knock out the. You really, you have to knock out the Urza and the Emery. Um, and the eight eight token too. That one's kind of big. Well, the Quattle can handle that, so that's like the one thing we do have covered. Uh, I guess the Caracas can reset some of those. The Emery it doesn't really deal with the, the Urza very well. Um, then we need Collector Oof, and maybe at that point we'll be okay. Yeah, it's it's asking for a lot though from this situation. So I'm I'm gonna be surprised to see if if Ryan's gonna be able to cobble it together. Honestly, like maybe what Ryan really just needs it's another Echo of Beyonds to find the right hand, just empty out what you can, and then you know just hope for the next turn. But really, like from this position, I have to imagine that the Echo of Beyonds would just <laughs> completely take over the game from uh, Greg's side. So yeah, okay. So Oko steals the Urza in in exchange for the Astrolabe, and there is the Collector Oof. Okay. 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 All right. Maybe. Maybe. Maybe miracles do happen after that was, all. I mean, oh, that was a good. I mean, well, Ryan did get to start the turn with seven cards plus his draw step, so he's obviously going to have a lot to do. That mattered. Okay. Emery gets bounced. Yeah. I mean, the drawing of the other Urza is not ideal, but still, this is this is a pretty interesting game. Yeah, actually, this is kind of crazy because I, I, as as much as I've been saying that you know this game was looking kind of over, it uh, collector oof is just is lights out for this deck, right? So here we see like you can't access your seat of the synods, Mox Opal turned off, you know Arkham's Astrolabe also not doing anything, so that was kind of a freebie. I mean, we get we get another Urza token, but I guess Urza can convert the Seed of the Synods into actual mana, just like in a weird yeah. way. But it's, yeah, but we don't have anything to do aside from spin Urza. Mm -hmm. um, so we can trade off that first token for the Quaddle, and then I guess Oko is going to have to Elkify the Urza. Well, actually, Joe, the, the Quaddle doesn't have Death Touch now. We've got all these duels in play that, and oh, we gave up the Arkham's right. Astrolabe too. Oh wow! Okay, well that definitely matters then. Yeah. I, I think what may end up having to happen here is now we need to maybe find something like Karn, gum up the board state, and maybe get like a Mycosynth Lattice into play or something like that. We do have control over the board right now with these 8-8s that are kind of just dictating the pace of the game. So now we need a f way to just maybe like lock it up, prevent... Yeah. I mean, we need to find... I, I, yeah, I still think with... I mean, Ryan's got several cards left in hand. We need, we need a way to deal with this Oko before... Um, our Urza gets wiped out because in addition to having cards in hand, Ryan can activate his own copy of Urza. And try and <laughs> that's, get that's also. actually kind of funny. I have never had the pleasure of doing that out of the snow deck, but we'll see what happens here. I mean, Urza versus well, Urza, who usually wins? Well, that Emery just dumped three Karns into the graveyard. So the chance of your Karn bailout plan just got dramatically lower. Um, 
Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna one time the not like this. This is uh, you hate to see it. <laughs> wow, that was that was something. <laughs> that was something. That uh, okay. So let's see what can we hit with Urza. Uh, maybe Echo of Eons wouldn't be too bad here either. <clears throat> Although I, I, th- I think yeah, we're checking to see what we can hit with Urza here too. So yeah. we'll find out pretty shortly. Even if we hit Echo, I mean, we're we're doing it. We're spinning it up and passing the turn, which is not not the greatest either. Yeah, I, I it, something. It's, it's certainly tricky, right? Like Echo, maybe yeah. into like Psy. The first thing that we want to do, I think, is just get on the board, continue yeah. getting on the board, rather, and then then maybe we can figure it out. Echo would also reset the cards too, and put them all back yeah. in the deck. So that'd be pretty That's good. True. That's true. And actually, I mean, we're only at uh, by we have I mean, Greg. Greg's only at five. Uh, spins up Ancient Tomb. That is not going to help. Yeah, a- Ancient Tomb, not the not what you want here. And this is an attack. Yeah, attack Oko. I think Clyde Chump locks, which is un- no. Okay, Oko's given up. All right, and I, I like this. You let the Oko die. That means either you have another one in your hand, or you're trying to get aggressive. I mean, with Greg at five life, yeah, that's not unreasonable. Right. In fact, actually, so we have how much damage can we do right now? Just, uh, just two, right? And there's obviously no way we're jamming into that. Oof, okay, this is probably just an error. Unless we're trying to get cards in the graveyard for Uro. Mm. I guess the Caracas could bounce the Urza, then we attack for at least one, and then they block. So we get one, four points of damage in this turn. Which is which is a sizable amount. Yeah. Okay, there is the Uro. Yeah, that ponder had to be a mistake. Well, I guess I was going to say just go sequencing, but maybe you would do it the way anyway. So would you use this Caracas to reset your Uro? No, we do not do that. We save it for the Emery, which that is totally reasonable. Yeah, I think in this position, like, I re- actually, I'd probably bounce the Urza here because then we want to just, like, sort of choke our opponent out of having access to any mana, right? Well, hmm, bounce the Urza. I mean, the thing that gives me this trouble is the token, so I don't know if I'm on board with that plan. Okay. The, the Qualo can now actually get Death Touch, so... But it's choosing to attack in anyway, as I guess there's real, no real reason to defend when there's no Planeswalker left and we're at 21. That's actually a really good point. I guess I should be a little bit afraid here because if... Uh, you're right. These are two 9-9s in play. We play the Seed of the Synod and it becomes a 10-10. If we draw exactly another artifact, then we get to actually swing for lethal here, which is... All right, combat math, not my specialty, but... Well, <laughs> I mean, that's not even really what I was referring to, but you're right. Oh my goodness. That's huge. The fourth card. That is that is huge. How much mana is available right now? The Ancient Tomb uh, is shut off. Mm-hmm. Two, oh, but there's Urza. So there's two, four, five, six, seven, eight. There's nine. Oh, so see the sign that's still tapped for mana, right? Yeah, yeah, because of the Urza, right? Right, right, right. Okay. So there's actually plenty. Yeah. So we could maybe... Karn Bridge, play out a land and the Emery, and then at least the food token won't be able to attack. That's kind of nice. Um, I guess they could bounce the Emery or, or like any creature to give us two points, but you know, two is not three. Collect Roof not being able to. Plus, we've got like nine nines in place. So, yeah, br- bridge, bridge is definitely one reasonable line here for sure. Okay. Can we hold the. F- Let's see. I mean, we could even just Karn Lattice here, right? Yeah, as we were going to say, if we went Lattice, can we hold the board down? I think we can. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Yeah, so two C to the Synods, that's two mana, two islands, four. Lab, Opal, Chalice, Chalice, Petal, that's five. Five plus four. We can't tap the. We definitely cannot tap the uh, the construct tokens here because we need them to no, block. Right. We need them to block. We can't use ancient tomb. But still, the seed of the sun in hand. Play that. So that's three seats is three. Two islands is five. Astrolabe mox two chalice petal. That's ten. Yep. That's enough. And then I think as long as there's no dried arbor, we would survive. Uh, I don't believe there is dried arbor in this deck list. So nope. looks like we could get survive get attacked to one and then. Win? I think so, yeah, because 
we would be able to. No, nope, I, mean, I take no, no, no. I I take it back. That's that's maybe because there's a collector roof in play. So Karn Lance doesn't just lock out the opponent; it locks out us also. Oh my goodness! So it, and actually, uh, I think if that were to happen, I think we lose the decking. Because you're right. We could never attack. Yeah, it would be. Yeah, we would get decked if we did that. See, that's that's not something I had thought about too. Collector Oof doubling down here, not just stopping every single artifact in play, but also turning off the the despicable. I maybe it might be a little bit biased, but the card lattice lock, which you can so powerful that it's not even in modern anymore. Yeah. So that makes things tricky. Then, like, what do you? <laughs> yes, it does. <laughs> this is tricky, which is why this turn is taking so long because there's a yeah. lot. Yeah. Dang, it's times like these where... Well, I played a blue-white Bomberman list lately, uh, recently, and there was a glass casket in the sideboard, which was nice for Collector Oof, exactly. I mean, obviously, when you're in mono blue, you oh, can't... that's cool. Yeah. All right, so we, we went ahead and just spun up Urza because it looks like mm -hmm. the other plans just leave us a little bit shy of stabilizing. Yeah. This artifact, um, by adding... What do we say we need? I wasn't counting the artifacts. Do we need two artifacts to have a lethal attack? Uh, right. We have one, two, plus five, is seven, eight, nine artifacts in play right now. So, yeah. Yeah. But then, so Urza would chump block, and then we'd die in the swing back. Right. So that's just barely shy of working. Yep. And so, so it looks like we're just activating again. Submerge! Whoa. That's it. <gasps> we that's, win, right? We, we that's so it. crazy! Oh, my goodness. I feel like we just stole a win out of here from nowhere. Yeah, we really did. So yep. if we submerge Urza, play, we already played the seat, play the pedal, and we attack for 23 damage. Unbelievable. Yeah, that's pretty crazy. Let's see if let's see if uh, Greg is able to see the line here with one card in hand. There's two chalices in play, so it can't be a red elemental blast. All I get right. the feeling that this this uh, submerge is uh, it has to be an abrupt decay, and we're submerging onto the top of our own deck anyway. So now yeah. we have to play next turn. Got Urza's for days here, and 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 yeah, Ryan sees it. You know the the submerge is public information. Sees the writing on the wall. Okay, I mean we 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 have it here. Yeah, attack okay. for twenty two. The only so an abrupt decay would require life points, so it would actually be neutral with. Um, okay, so it looks like the player is switching to to then go watch the coverage. So it looks like the match is gonna be over with. So maybe we want to go ahead and bring it back. Yeah, back. Yeah, sounds good. Okay, yep. so that was uh, if you didn't enjoy that game, then well. You're either, I mean, you just must be a, a snow fan. You're from the Arctic or something because that was really cool. Uh, I, I got to tell you, that Urza top deck was so sick. I mean, this is why we play Urza in the deck, right? Because it's able to convert all of the artifacts into just oodles and noodles of mana. And mm -hmm. Urza is kind of just the perfect card to leverage that as well, right? It puts, it also just put a, a critical artifact token into play twice. We got two tokens, which, yeah. is, which was huge. And I mean, this is why I think the matchup is just really, really bad for Snow, right? Because yeah. you have to be able to answer every single threat. I mean, and if one small thing slips to the crack, it's it's over. Given the things that went right that game for Ryan, and he still lost. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that was, I mean, sure, that was kind of a, a low odds win. I mean, obviously that the, the um, Urza deck had basically given up and just like, mm -hmm. oh, none of this is going to work. I'll just spin and I'll spin again and then... There you go. <laughs> it is submerged. Game winner. Oh, that was fun. All right. We got uh, a couple matches still playing, so let's go ahead and bring up where round so far. The the matches where you don't see the results, uh, which on this page is just two of them, and one of them we do know is finished but hasn't been entered yet. But we just see Connery Knox with Maverick, who was 4-0, uh, wins again. Uh, defeating Michael Ardoin with Omnitel, so first loss there. Uh, Will Kruger also advances to 5-0 and alongside, uh, I'm not sure on the names and the rest of you, who actually was undefeated in the rest of the matches there. But we should have a couple undefeated players after this round. We see Dominic Harvey rebounds and beats Elves, which I would think is maybe a little bit difficult matchup for Depths. Elves might be too fast for them a lot of time, I would think. I don't know. Uh, any, any thoughts on here, what we're seeing? 
Yeah, that that's kind of interesting. Oh, it's and and you know it's it's crazy too because Topher Stitson is. Uh, in my opinion, one of the most talented uh, legacy players in general. There were a couple of years on Magic Online where he was just tearing apart the metagame, taking every single trophy with, you know, trusted, tried, tried and true blue decks. So it's kind of interesting to see that he's playing elves today. Um, but, you know, Dom is also very talented. So I, I'm not surprised to see that uh, that mirror match, or sorry, not mirror match, but green, whatever you get what I'm trying to say. Uh, yeah. It is a close match for sure. I, I wouldn't be surprised. Marcus Ewald playing Jeskai Control with a couple standstills. Now that's pretty interesting to me. Uh, I think he is now going to be three and two, having beaten Red Green Land. So that's also pretty interesting. Mm -hmm. And then yeah. um, be easy. All right, let's go to the next page. Yeah. Let's see what else there is. And then we saw Fenris Cloud, aka Sam Dan's, also not making it out this round, but taking a look at the second set of rounds here. Okay, so okay. we still have you know, one more match. So there's, there's two matches still playing. Uh, S. Revile versus Eldrazi, Eldrazi Stompy being the other one. Yeah. All right. So All back, right. so back to us for a couple minutes here. Honor, did you submit a deck for this event if you were playing? Do we have one for you? I, I actually didn't. And that's because I okay. I was trying out a list that I wanted to play. So I, I, I know I submitted a list last time and uh, it was just, you know, mm -hmm. some sort of stock snow deck. The list that I was trying out in the past few days actually involved uh, incorporating a lot of elements from one of the newer decks from the format, which is called Pokey Pile. Uh, it's just, uh, it's named after the creator of the deck, Pokey uh Jeff White, who comes up with a lot of sick brews, uh, you know, Pokey Pile, Rector, Alurin, these kind of things, cool decks. And I tried stealing some elements from that deck and putting it into my deck. So I upped the number of stifles to a full three copies with three wastelands too. So I was, functionally playing a six color deck right like with five five colors and then you know wasteland being colorless okay. uh, so that that's kind of a lot yeah it did not work out <laughs> uh <laughs> i i think that it's the, the the concept is still there right leveraging stifle is sort of like a ramp spell to take over the game with sylvan library and uro that's kind of cool but mm -hmm. i it still needs a lot more tuning and that sort of stuff so didn't really want to submit it here because i can't really advise it to anyone but i'll be working on it for sure just to make I submitted sure the deck that i wouldn't necessarily advise anyone for this 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 time around i was going to play enchantress for this event okay um, all right actually always yeah so here's here's the deck that i i would have submitted for today so this just, is I, interesting okay so yeah, I just I saw someone had a result with it. I didn't really like all the choices, so I was like, okay, I'll try Enchantress again, which I haven't played in a couple of years, and I kind of updated with some of the new cards. Uh, I think, and the Enchantress like we saw this morning looked more like an old style one. I think the On Thin Ice is a really significant uh, addition to the deck, as mm -hmm. it's basically a source of Plasters effect that can can trip if you're any later in the game than you know turn one or two. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I, I was I've enjoyed it. I played a couple leagues with it this week and um, moved a few cards around. I think it still needs some work. It was pointed out during my stream yesterday that playing a Reclamation Sage is just worse than playing um, Night of was it Night of Autumn. Autumn, yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's absolutely correct. That was just an oversight by me. But um, yeah, this is a super slow deck, but it is it is fun to play. You just try and build up a kind of an uncrackable board state and win with Emrakul eventually. There are other win conditions, but I don't, they're not important. I actually thought about cutting the helm. Okay. Like yeah. yeah. Destiny spinner. Uh, Cause the that's kind of interesting. So you're playing main deck rest in peace. The, do you think it's like well positioned in the metagame right now? I think rest in peace is just a reasonable card. Like if you're playing, it's just like the carpet of flowers. You're, you're playing like cyborg cards that there are enchantments. So they're basically cantrips anyway, if things are working. Okay. So you can run different stuff. The rest in peace obviously matters a lot against, a number of different decks, including just against Delver, where you shut off Dreadheart Arcanist and, you know, Hooting Mandals and stuff. I think that's good enough to to play it. Yeah, yeah, um, and it seems like it's pretty good. Oh, my God, you, you've got experience. We talked about this, uh, you know, a while ago where you had, like, Rest in Peace and Energy Field. I re even remember watching a feature match about that. Right. Um, let me ask you about Destiny Spinner. So what does this card do, and uh, is it good? I mean, it's okay. It's it's kind of, I wanted to have a few uh, win conditions that I mean, the Emrakul can basically clean things up in all cases, except if it's if you have Rest in Peace in play and the Emrakul gets Thought Seized, then you're stuck. So I want to have a couple of ways it can win. So we have the one Helm and the one Destiny Spinner, which can, you know, it makes all your... If we can pop a Destiny Spinner so people can read it if they're not familiar with it. Um, it makes, you know, all your other stuff uncounterable. Basically makes the whole deck uncounterable. Yeah. So the so Destiny Spinner is a one and a green enchantment creature. Uh, creature type is human. Says creature and enchantment spells you control cannot be countered. And it has an activated ability. You pay three and a green. 
It says, it says, target land you control becomes an XX elemental creature with trample and haste until end of turn, where X is the number of enchantments you control, um, and it's still a land. And it's cool that you don't even have to tap to activate the Destiny Spinner right. ability, so you could just, you know, go Cavern, play Destiny Spinner, activate yeah. the ability all in the same turn, and just attack for a, a yeah. lot of damage. With Sarah's activity, a lot of mana. And then also, yeah, with Cavern, you can put this in, and then your whole deck's uncounterable. So if they're not right. playing removal, then, you know, maybe they're stuck. It's not a great deck yet, probably ever, but uh, I've enjoyed it. It's a different thing to, to try out. Um, yeah, it was fun. Anyway, cool. uh, that's going to be it, I guess, for round number five. Is that round five? Yeah. That was round five, yeah. Yeah, it was round five. Okay, so we're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back with the pairings for round six. The NRG series is brought to you by Card Hoarder. Card Hoarder is Magic Online's premier source for online singles. Take advantage of their loan program so you can always play the hottest tier one deck. Borrow from their huge inventory of Magic Online cards for a low weekly fee with no hassle delivery and returns. You can try out their loan program today with a free five ticket loan account. Get more information about Magic Online's top source for cards at cardhoarder.com. Looking for some inspiration for your next deck? Check out the top performing deck list from today's tournament at nerdragegaming.com. You can also take a look at our coverage archives, metagame breakdowns, deck lists from previous events, and more. Nerdragegaming.com is the exclusive home for everything NRG series. The NRG series is brought to you by KMC Sleeves. KMC is your go-to source for magic sleeves, perfect fits, and storage boxes. They're rated the best overall sleeve brand by Tolarian Community College, and each purchase comes with a 100% customer satisfaction guarantee. Shop online at kmcsleeves.com or nerdragegaming.com and get yourself the best sleeves on the market today. NerdRageGaming.com is the place to get your hands on all the hottest Magic singles. Browse our full selection of staples from every format and shop an exclusive inventory you won't find anywhere else. Shop regularly and get rewarded for each purchase with our Customer Rewards Program. Automatically earn store credit each time you shop and work your way up to 10% back on all orders. Be sure to use the code STAYHOME for free shipping. All this and more at nerdragegaming.com. Follow the NRG series on social media on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and Instagram. You'll find information on upcoming events, important announcements, event recaps and VODs, plus behind the scenes photos and videos directly from the NRG series. Connect with us today. Rewards are priceless. The wonders, peerless. The adventures, perilous. It's time for the newest set, Zendikar Rising. Pick up singles, draft boosters, set boosters, and collector boosters today at nerdragegaming.com. Quantities are limited, so place your order now. All right, we're back, and uh, we're going to be moving into round six. I'm here with Arag Das as we're moving through our legacy trial today. But uh, before we get, before the players are ready, we do have a new set dropping next week: Zendikar Rising. And we're going to pick out a couple more cards to talk about here. So let's uh, let's see what's first up. I'm excited for the new set. I know we've talked about a couple cards already, but this one is pretty interesting. Skyclave Apparition. So one white, white, it's a core spirit, and it says when it enters the battlefield, you can exile up to one target, non-land, non-token permanent, you don't control, with CMC4 or less. It also says when it uh, leaves the battlefield, the exiled card's owner makes an XX creature where X is the CMC of the card. Mm -hmm. Lots 
of hype around this card. Uh, what is your first glance of? What is your first thought about it? Okay, so so we're basically saying we can oblivion ring small things, anything yeah. we want, right? Mm-hmm. And then when this thing gets dealt with, instead of getting the card back, we just get a flying token. Yeah. 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 Okay. That's that is different. That is unique. So we've had effects like this before, where like without on seer, you deal with it, you get a different card back. Mm-hmm. With Oblivion Ring itself, Faceless, Faceless Butcher, the original version of the card, you got what you lost back. And and now you're just getting back a flying token. Huh. Um, I mean, the ability to, if you're playing like Death and Taxes or something, the ability to wipe out anything is yeah, so yeah. cool. And it's cheap, too. I mean, three mana instead of four, that's that's nice. Um, now, giving your opponent a flyer? Yeah, I suppose in, in a lot of decks, you could set up a situation where even if that does happen, it doesn't. It's not. Doesn't really matter. You don't care that much. It's probably not as bad as the thing you dealt with in the first place. Okay, yeah. and the token doesn't even fly, so even better. Yeah, it's kind of interesting too because I feel like Death and Taxes is one of the decks that is just like kind of phased out of the meta game, right? Like the combination of like Oko, Plague Engineer, all these sort of things has has really just you know made made the the humans the the white weenie archetype very very difficult to pilot and play successfully so it's kind of nice to see watsy you know just like you know this new card you know, pushing that give, giving a little bit of help to, to that archetype right what's really interesting to me is that not, i mean let's say you uh you know get rid of something like an oka right with the trigger on the stack you could even like violin something like a flicker wisp and actually get rid of something else too right, right? yeah um because the the what is it called the the text on the card says um when it actually that's that's kind of interesting so how does that work when it it's, it's got the like the split text like restoration angel so it says uh you know if you if you remove the creature from play before that first trigger actually resolves yeah. then how, what happens with the 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 second the second uh, trigger how does that actually apply do they still yeah, get the next the, the way this the way this is written it looks like you can if you flicker wisp with it on the stack it looks like you just get a card for free that's okay. Yeah. To me. They don't get a token for it, so it, it's kind of templated the old way, not the new way. Right. Right. Uh, which is kind of interesting to see. Yeah, that's that's pretty significant. So, any sort of blink effect, uh, well, Flicker was primarily. Yeah. I mean, so you you basically have one thing trapped to come back as a potential token later, and the other thing is just gone. That's insane. Yeah, that is, and that is definitely going to be. And you're yeah. I mean, I agree with you. Death and Taxes has kind of been overpowered lately, and this is something that can. You know, maybe deal them back in the game a little bit. It's another strong card. I don't know. Well, I'm not going to speculate what gets replaced by it, but uh, but yeah, that is that is a meaningful interaction for sure. And being able to wipe out planeswalkers, yeah. I mean, that's. I mean, they have revokers and stuff to deal with them, but revokers are pretty easy to pick off. And and this, yeah, that's nice. I would rather like if my lockdown permanent dies, instead of their thing turning back on, I'd rather just have them have a three three. That's. That's Absolutely, great. yeah. I mean, because in the grand scheme of things, too, like a three-three against the deck that is literally geared to, you know, yeah. have superiority in creature combat doesn't really matter too much, right? Like you've got all the equipment to, to to take over the board. It's just like the non-creature permanents that sometimes can cause issues and things like that. And th- I mean, I feel like this card is going to be a huge addition to the sideboard or the, even just the main deck. This is a main deckable card, I think, in Death and Taxes. So I'm kind of excited to see how the, you know, the Death and Taxes players will maybe reinvigorate the archetype. Plus, you can like tutor it off Recruiter of the Guard, so it's like yeah. if when you want it, you can get it. And shares a creature type with Stoneforge Mystic, so potentially Cavern of Souls could come back into the deck. There's a lot of things that you can be doing here with this card. Uh, so, yeah, that's pretty exciting. Okay, next see one it. up is Seagate Stormcaller, which is our new sort of Snapcaster Mage, except not really. Yeah, I know when people when this card was first uh, when this card was first released, people said like you know this card is definitely overhyped. It's not going to be playable in any of the in the like the eternal formats. And the more I look at the card, the more I see that like maybe it's not necessarily Snapcaster Mage that it doesn't have the upsides of Snapcaster Mage, but like there is value in and of itself, right? So. I mean, think about like what what are some of the cards that you would want to double up on, right? The one thing that this card does that Snapcaster doesn't do is that it saves you actual mana, right? So. You play a one drop and then you play Snapcaster Mage, right? That's actually a total of four mana that you're going to be spending. Seagate Stormcaller, you play the one drop. You don't actually have to pay for the second copy of the one drop. Right. So you're actually netting mana here. And and imagine if you're playing a two drop as well. Well, then you're seeing a lot more, you know, mana efficiency, right? Like if you buy back like an Abrupt Decay or, you know, something like that. That'd be pretty yeah. cool too. Yeah, um, and I also like how it's 
you know, before, if the Snapcaster Mage, okay, maybe you have a Spell Pierce or a Force of Negation or something like that, and you only care about stopping the spell. Well, Snapcaster Mage comes in, you can do that. Here, you know, if you have a Force of Negation or, or whatever, you're still going to face un- one copy of the spell because you can't stop both of them. Right, yeah, it's got to yeah, be something so. crazy like Flusterstorm to hit both of them and... I don't yeah. even know if that's going to be that good. Yeah. Yeah. So like this, even like turn three. I mean, this and this is doable in lower powered formats. Just turn three. This followed by a thought seize. That's strong. Yeah, absolutely. Right? I mean, it's just two cards out of the hand. I mean, that's I mean, you lose a lot of life. But I mean, just the the implication of it with whatever with bolts. I mean, you play this on turn three. This bolt you hit hit two things. That seems nice. And then the, the kicker is a lot. So I don't know how often we'll see that come into play. Probably but, won't, yeah. Yeah, but this is a pretty neat card. Yeah, I, I definitely I like that a lot too. Um, yeah, and the last card that I'm kind of interested in pairing with this, maybe we'll see Cabal Therapy. I feel like Cabal Therapy works really well with Seagate sure. Stormcaller. So yeah, definitely. Pretty exciting, yeah. All right. Uh, but let's, let's take a look ahead. at the new Nahiri as well, right? The Planeswalker? Mm-hmm. Yeah, New Nahiri looked kind of uh, determined in the uh, Zendikar um, preview video, which I thought was really well done. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, maybe a, few, a few flaws with the lip syncing because maybe they changed the script was what I saw someone, someone suggest, but it looked really cool. And so we have Nahiri here at the start of that video and a new card with the uh, kind of the – I like the Planeswalkers, I believe, where the ultimate is usable. It's not a game-winning ultimate, but it's an ultimate yeah. that you can use the turn it comes into play, which is yeah. kind of adds a nice variety. I like the yeah, like the utility ultimate, right? So yeah. generally speaking, like the planeswalkers have had a a recipe where the uptick would you know create some sort of advantage. The minus two was removal, and then the, there was a big ultimate that would win the game. And I really mm-hmm. feel like Watsi has changed the recipe. I, I wouldn't necessarily say that this card is going to be playable in Legacy, but it's going to be definitely. I think it's going to see a lot of play in maybe the new standard format, or you know just like the the lower powered formats like Pioneer. Probably not modern unless there's like a really new deck that can actually leverage this card. Um, what is it, a Colossus Hammer or something like that? Uh, uh, that's a big one, yeah. Yeah, you can uptick and make a 1-1 one, one, then just equip uh, the hammer to that immediately. Mm-hmm. Uh, but but yeah, I mean, this this one's going to be pretty powerful in, in, in some of the lower-powered formats. I think 4 mana for a card that... It, it's just too expensive in Legacy to, for, the, for the impact to actually matter. So I'm kind of curious to see what it'll do in the new set and you know, see if there are any cool equipments that can, you know, Lahiri can leverage to, to create all right, just like explosive board states, yeah. Right. Okay, so let's go ahead and um, do we have standings, or we we have the round completed now? If so, do we have standings to look at? Or okay, we actually no, we don't. We still have one match playing. All right. So on our we have to fill a couple more minutes here. I know that you're capable of doing that. So uh, um, let, let's talk about how what what we have now as far as the like, we had a legacy PTQ yesterday on Magic mm-hmm. Online. Uh, yeah. We have occasional legacy events like ours here, where the um, you know I, I think reasonable pricing, um, some payoffs for actually doing well and advancing further in in the wizards stuff. But we don't really have like organized legacy that encompasses like you know different different locations. Really, it's just individual events kind of come together. Like, what is there any? Do you think are you optimistic at all that we'll get to having some big legacy series or some legacy will become more important? Or are we thinking we're just, this is where we're at right now, and we'll just, you know, it'll play itself out over the rest of time? Yeah, I mean, this is kind of a little bit, I don't know, because, you know, with the recent Star City announcement that they were trying to take, you know, Legacy off the circuit just in place of Pioneer, that was kind of a real Debbie Downer. But I, I think with the recent addition of MTG Melee, especially in, you know, this time, like, you know, the COVID era or whatever it is, mm. I think MTG Melee might just be the future of Legacy and just being able to host online tournaments very much so like this. I think it's going to be really on the Legacy, uh, you know, just the players of the Legacy uh, format, the community to come together. I know I, for one, am looking into how to set up tournaments, recurring tournaments, and just be able to provide coverage and that sort of stuff because there, there is nothing like being able to just, you know, turn on your TV on a, you know, Sunday, cozy Sunday, and then just... Watch your favorite format, you know, watch your favorite game, watch, you know, players play off in a, in a high stakes event with, you know, just like the best players in the format, right? Like I want to be able to watch, you know, Dom Harvey tackle down snow with, with this new impressive deck that he's cobbled together. Flagstones of Trocare, you don't really see that all the time. Yeah. And yeah, I think it's definitely going to be on us to sort of put together these kind of events. And, you know, it's also going to be on us to play in these events and just show support, say, hey, look, you know, we want this stuff. We want the format to thrive. We want the format to survive. 
and you know, it, it's it's going to be a community effort for sure. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, people showing up, people watching, people playing, whatever they can do is just that's really what drives it. Whether it's us or other other organizations, yeah, just having really that's the biggest thing is you have to. I mean, there's a lot of I mean, not just in magic, just in everything. People are like, oh, it's important. This is important to me. But then when it's time to actually show up, they're not there. And so it's just, <laughs> yeah, when people showing up matters. And that's how we can do something like this. And having now this is our last legacy event of this year for Nerd Rage. But uh, definitely plan on bringing it back next year as, as long as the support continues. I yeah, love this. And, and major I shout out to the people here today who are watching. Thank you so much for tuning yeah. in. It is with we cannot do this without your help, your support so yeah props to you guys as well this is a definitely a community effort yeah the um as far as okay now something else we can do let's go ahead so some of you watching uh, may have been watching some of the community streams that have happened over the last bef the kind of the week leading into our events both um Honorog has been doing it myself and then uh, jarvis you and i think um julian did it last time also we've given away a couple like free invites to the upcoming events so now that we're actually in the middle of, we know what the upcoming events are. Our next event is going to be October 4th, and it's going to be Modern, our next trial, which is the same prizing as today. Uh, you know what? Let's, while we're waiting for the round to finish, uh, we'll go ahead and give away an invite into that next event. Um, okay, I'm ready. So, yeah, you're ready? Okay, so <laughs> let me go ahead and, and set this up. I think I'm in the uh, a thing here and um, kind of just winging this as we are waiting for the round. But... Uh, let me get this in there. So again, you're watching on Nerd Rage. So let's fire this up. And there it is. So if you're interested in winning a free entry into our modern event next month on October 4th, type Nerd Rage in the chat right now. And then in a couple minutes, we'll throw out a, a free entry into uh, for a random winner. All right. So, I put my name in the in the gauntlet. So let's see. <laughs> let's see if this this giveaway is truly rigged or not. Um, uh, so while while we're so while that's filling and while it's populating, I wanted to ask you because something significant happened for you this week in Magic is you are now associated with a team. Oh yeah, that's true. I I uh, I did sign with the uh, Team Lotus Box this week, and it was it's pretty crazy. I've been I, I've known Zan for a long time. I think like we went we were both in Atlanta for college, and you know it's kind of crazy how we met. We just. He was two seats down for me uh, at my first standard SCG open, and we we're like, "Hey, what's up?" We had a lot of mutual friends, and from there, like, it just kick started. Um, but yeah, I'm I'm super excited for this opportunity because I, I don't know, I'm really passionate about legacy, and I'm really passionate about seeing like the format thrive, survive. You know, I mean, you, hopefully it comes off. And 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 I've talked to Zan, and you know, he he's got big dreams. I've got big dreams. We really want to change the game and just like make magic. <sighs> Here's the truth, right? I I don't know how much of this I'm supposed to say, which is probably red flags, but I feel like <laughs> Magic compared to other esports has a lot of room to pick up. I agree. Um, and and I think because there's so much room for innovation, it's just on us to you know push the envelope uh, a little bit you know further. You know, make sure that we are actually able to you know accomplish and be as great as all the other games that are out there. And and yeah. you know, Zan's got big dreams for that. I do too, and I'm really looking forward to just working with him and producing like the next era of of magic content and just setting the bar for what you know should be and setting that bar high. You know, no reason to settle for anything less than right. you know, perfect. So definitely, magic's a game where compared to a lot of the other games, I feel like our presence as an esport doesn't doesn't level doesn't rise to the level of the actual game itself. Yeah, yeah, and, and so that's good. That's good to hear you doing something like that. Again, if you're interested in playing in getting a free entry into the next modern event, our next modern event, go ahead and type Nerd Rage in the chat right now, and we're about to be give away a free entry while we're waiting for round six to get going. I was actually curious when I saw that announcement. I was like, hmm, I wonder if Honorog is trying to pull them into Legacy, or if they're trying to pull Honorog into like the formats that they play a lot more of, which is the, kind of the SCG formats, like Modern, Pioneer, Standard, that kind of thing. Because you don't play too much of those formats, do you, at all? I will confess, okay. I have recently gotten into Arena. I've been playing a little bit of Historic, not too much here. I wanted to be able to keep up with the... The Invitational, just to make sure you know, I know what's exactly going on. I, I think MTG Arena is actually just probably the number one best thing that could have happened to Magic just in general. Obviously, I'm a little bit sad that it doesn't have every single card because so you right. can't play like Legacy on there. But that that is like a huge endeavor, and I'm not gonna you know sweat too many bullets. I mean, I just think about that is just making my mind almost 
uh, explode. But uh, yeah, I, I, I think um, it, it's going to be both ways, right? Like I've talked to Zan. I told him straight up foremost, first and foremost, that I, I want to make sure that legacy is like properly represented. That is very important to me. And he said that my primary role would just be, you know, among other things, it would be to you know provide legacy content and share that with the Lotus Box community. So I'm definitely looking forward to that. That is going to be pretty exciting uh, just to share, you know, the, like the latest and greatest. And, you know, for example, like when I don't know what's going to happen to Legacy after Zendikar Rising. So, if, you know, just in general, I think this is a lower powered set compared to what we've been used to in the past year or so. Well, that's good. Yes, I agree. That is definitely good. So I, I wouldn't be surprised if like the updates and the nuances are going to be like a little bit lesser in terms of like power level, but that's also, I mean, that's pretty good because again, like legacy is a format with so much depth that it is actually just very exciting to be able to see the, the tiny things, right? Like appreciate the details more than not. So we're going to see just like how, how impactful some of the new cards are going to be. For example, like in, in Belcher decks, right? Like they're actually getting an upgrade in this deck or maybe it's a lateral grade, you know? Yeah, that, that's yeah, really. I, I, we briefly talked about that earlier today when Caroline was here, but I, I think it's super interesting that like, just, I mean, I worked on Belcher like 10 years ago just for fun as a project. And yeah, it was, you know, what wasn't even an option before was like land grant or four land grants, one Taiga. Well, now you could, that's five total of that type of card. Now you could play six, you could play eight, you, could, you know, and it's just, there was no option before. And so it's cool to see, maybe it'll end up the same as it is now, but uh, yeah. the options there that wasn't before. And that's kind of a cool impact of new cards it's not going to overpower anything, but it just provides more options. And that's, that's, that's a nice thing to see. For sure. For sure. Yeah. I spoke with the Belcher expert, Jax MTG, and, and he, he looks at all sort of turn one kill decks. And he told me that one of the reasons why these lands are going to be so powerful is because, you know, land grant is a great card. Zero mana get a Taiga. Sure. But you know what's not great? The second land grant, especially when you only have one Taiga, right? So being yeah. able to remove that layer of inconsistency is just like a small, like, all right, you know, quality of life kind of deal, which I think is going to be pretty important for these kind of decks. So yeah. another yeah. thing, it's it, well, another, so something that sounds seems significant to me is that cards like Veil of Summer, for example, which would be great in that deck, is pretty hard to cast. Mm -hmm. But when you have you without changing your mana base, you could then effectively have like access to some more lands in the cyborg games when you might want it, I, I think that's kind of cool. Yep, absolutely. So, yeah, all right, so it looks like, okay, so it looks like we are kind of finishing up on the entries. I'll give it another 30 seconds or so for people that are just joining up. If you're interested in winning an entry into our modern event on October 4th, go ahead and write NerdRage in the chat, and we'll get that finished up in just a bit. In the meantime, the round has ended, so we're going to go ahead and bring up the standings. Moment, yeah. We're going to move into... Uh, round six. So we see here uh, we have two undefeated players left, Connery Knox and Will Kruger, who we've seen already today. And then a whole smattering of stuff, including uh, Francis Satosh is four and one with ten fins, I believe. Okay, that is a blast from the past. Like actual yeah. Ice Station Zebra, let's go. So I haven't seen the deck list, but yeah, I, I've been told it is in fact ten fins, so that's pretty cool. We see Greg Dyer, who we saw with Mono Blue Prison at 4-1. And, and Dominic Harvey has recovered from his earlier loss and also at 4-1. Lewis Kaplan at 4-1, who you, even if you don't know it, you may recognize his voice from our new uh, ads. He um, did the favor of um, going through those at, for us. Uh, Justin Brickman, a local for Nerd Rage Gaming, is 4-1 uh, with Four Color Snow Go, doing much better than he did last month with Goblins. And let's go ahead and move on to the next page if we have a next page yeah i mean so far this metagame portfolio is looking very diverse and i'm pretty happy to see i mean we've got a lot of deliver we've got a lot of snoko but we are seeing a couple of the other variety decks like maverick for example is great we see here eldrazi stompy x and two sultai hogak elves ban infect there's a lot of stuff going on here so i i you know i i'm looking forward to it and you know what x2 you're still live for this tournament uh you know given the tournament structure so all of these players uh, you know they're gonna play their hearts out try to get those last two slots get that Get that um, entry into the arena qualifier weekend. That's right, right? Yeah. Yeah. And then, uh, you know, additionally, the prizing that we've got for today's tournament. So, yeah, um, I'm pretty excited to see. Oh, yeah, yeah. In 13th place, Max uh, Max uh, Kaminoski. I hope I'm saying that right. But you know, they're streaming the event today, too. So it's going to be pretty sweet. Hopefully we can get them on the feature match one more time. And then. Um, okay. Perfect. So we're going to go ahead. Let's go ahead and bring it back to us. And it sounds like the round is paired. We're going to go ahead and go ahead and give away this entry right now. Here it is. I'll press this button. Oh, come on. Did I get is, it? Uh, looks like 
Rubik Marvin. Okay, well, all right. You know, if not me, uh, Rubik, congratulations. Yeah, they were on the feature match earlier today. I think it was round two or something like that, playing land. So that was pretty exciting. Uh, congratulations, Ruben. You get entry into the next event, the the modern the NRG series. So uh, look forward to seeing looking forward to seeing you there. There, you gotta slow down yeah, a little bit. If I you don't play modern. Well, now you.